Hello and welcome. I'm Adi Kayo, Editor-in-Chief of the AMA Journal of Ethics. Thank you for joining us for this video edition of Ethics Talk. I'm here with Larry Gostin, University Professor and Chair in Global Health Law at Georgetown University. And we will be talking about the challenges of balancing public health ethics and personal self-liberties during this COVID-19 pandemic. As someone who led the effort to develop model state public health acts, Professor Gostin can speak to this delicate balance better than anyone I know. Good afternoon, Larry. Thank you for being a guest on Ethics Talk today. Thanks so much for having me, appreciate it. So Larry, a, a recent population model from Columbia University estimated that if the U.S. had begun imposing social distancing measures one week earlier in March, about 36,000 fewer people would have died in the pandemic. And if the country had begun locking down cities and limiting social contact on March 1st, two weeks earlier than when most people started staying home, a vast majority of the nation's deaths, about 83% would have been avoided. The study concluded that as states reopen, outbreaks can get easily out of control unless officials closely monitor infections and clamp down on new flare-ups. While there's no way to turn the clock back, we can be better prepared going forward. Can you provide our audience with a brief primer on governmental authority during a public health emergency like this pandemic, and more specifically, how compulsory public health powers should be evaluated and justified ethically and legally? Well, those are two really great questions. Um, uh, and so let me just begin uh, with a primer on public health powers. Uh, in the United States, uh, the uh, primary public health powers um, are possessed by the states um, and to some extent cities. Um, so they have what's known as the police power. Now, I'm often asked, you know, where is this in the Constitution? Um, and, the, and some people say, well, it's the 10th Amendment, the so-called Reserved Powers Clause. In truth, it's not even that. Um, states and localities um, have been uh, exercising public health powers since um, the colonial era, mm -hmm. well before the Constitution was formed. They were sovereigns. Um, they exercised the police power and um, you know, everything from uh, slaughterhouses to hygiene, sanitation, um, uh, contaminated conditions, pests, things like that. And so when the constitution was written, um, it didn't need to give states this, these powers. It actually possessed them already. Um, and they still possess them. Uh, whereas the Constitution does give the federal government um, limited public health power. And so what is the federal role? So the federal role is they can exercise powers if necessary to prevent um, infections from coming into the United States, right. or they can do it to prevent infections across state lines. And so we've seen a lot of um, uh, political discussion as to, well, can the president just um, order states to go back to work? Um, can he order them to lock down? Um, are stay at home orders constitutional? Uh, can you ban church services? Um, this is the case that was just filed to the Supreme Court just yesterday. Um, all of these um, are prima facie 
um, within the state's police powers. The, right. And the federal government has no power to order a governor or a mayor um, to do any of these things. These are public health powers. Now, of course, public health powers have to abide by the Bill of Rights. You know, So, for example, we have a right to um, uh, freedom of expression and uh, freedom of assembly. But now states are banning large gatherings. Can it do that? The answer is yes. Um, the reason it can do it is because um, it's not targeting the freedom of assembly or the freedom of speech. It's a generally applicable public health rule that applies to everyone, um, whether you're protesting or you're not. Um, same thing with worship of religion. It's not targeting religion or any particular religion. This is a pure, this is a public health measure, pure and simple. And so the, the next uh, question you asked, a really good one, is how do you evaluate all this ethically? Um, for me, I've always had my own very strongly held views about public health ethics. So notice I say public health ethics rather than bioethics, which a lot of people say, because bioethics has been very medically oriented, you know, doctor-patient relationship and so forth. Public health ethics is, you know, is what is the ethical right thing to do when you're wanting to prevent injury and disease in the population? How far can you go to balance public health with human rights, civil liberties? So there isn't a right answer, but my firmly held view is you have to ask a series of questions. One, is there a major significant risk to the population? Clearly with COVID-19, it's unquestionably a ma more than a major risk. It's a once in a lifetime event. Right. Secondly, is the intervention evidence-based? That is, it, is it likely to significantly reduce that, that risk? And we found that, you know, with from, from the Columbia study to many others have shown that yes, um, these kinds of shelter in place, social distancing orders actually have a major evidence-based impact. And then thirdly, are there any less restrictive ways we could achieve the public health objective as, as well or better? In this case, there doesn't seem to be. Yes, we should be doing testing, contact tracing, isolation, quarantine, but at this stage where uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus is so widespread in the community, we do need um, general principles of masking, social distancing, um, and um, a gradual release of stay-at-home orders, but only gradual. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, uh, Primer. I think our audience uh, would as well. As you just alluded, these governmental powers reside at the federal level for national security reasons and at the regional, state, and local level for public health reasons. Given that public health emergencies pose challenges to American federalism with laws at the local, state, tribal, and federal levels that can result in conflicting jurisdictional claims and confusion about who is, who is responsible for doing what, what are the lessons that we should have learned during the first COVID-19 wave that we should heed if there is a flare up or there are subsequent waves later this year? Yeah, that's such a, an insightful uh, question. Um, you know, America is a federalist society. Um, we divide powers between cities, states, and the federal government and the tribal governments. This can be a source of great strength and great weakness. Um, it's great strength because, you know, in Justice Brandeis's words, um, uh, you know, states and cities can be laboratories for innovation. Yeah. Um, that is, you know, you can, you can have a lot of experiments going on and the best one will survive. And so federalism can be a great strength of ours. And as we've seen, I think very clearly to almost every American, 
um, most of the effective health communication action regulation has been by governors and mayors rather than at the federal level. Um, and, and so uh, that can be a strength. On the other hand, federalism can be an, a huge weakness as you've alluded to, um, because you know, when, you, when you have a pandemic, um, it's affecting the whole nation, it's affecting the whole world. You can't have you know, different uh, jurisdictions going their own way. Yeah. You can't have you know, one city that's you know, locking down and then the county right around it is not, or the state right around it, because that's just gonna be useless. And so for that, you need strong federal leadership and, and, and guidelines. Um, and uh, the, the, so if this were to happen again, we would still look to the states and the cities to have primary power, but I hope um, that we would, we would encourage at the federal level uh, the US CDC um, and other public health experts to make evidence-based guidance and really work in partnership with the states. That's the way it's worked great with CDC and public health in America for so long, but that is broken down, frankly, with COVID-19 um, because it's become so politicized. Um, public health has become politics. Yeah. Um, public health people, particularly at the national level, always have to look over their shoulder. You know, can I put out this guideline? Can I not? Um, you know, is this, a, is this something that the White House should be uh, looking at or a public health agency? And so, you know, for me, we have the best um, scientists and public health people in the world. Yeah. Places like the NIH, CDC, uh, the US FDA, are incomparable, but we need to unleash that um, with allowing them to sci allowing science to lead, um, and also um, funding them to the level that they will need um, to be successful. Yeah, I know. I appreciate your points about evidence-based public health leadership. Let's hope that uh, we return to that. If as, as, as experts say, there will be another wave uh, in the fall and winter. Yeah, there will. And I've just written in a medical journal article um, about, you know, what the fall will look like, the fall yeah. and winter, because, you know, you're going to have co-circulating um, uh, pandemic viruses, um, COVID, uh, SARS-2, COVID-19, and influenza. Right. Um, and so there could be a, a second wave um, of COVID, uh, even more so than the first. There could be and probably will be at least a moderate flu year. Um, and that's, so that's going to be a lot of stress on the health system. Yeah, no, I think you make some excellent points. So as the country and economy uh, slowly open up for the summer, there are bound to be hurdles as we try to figure out how to return to quote unquote normal as safely as possible across a wide swath of social and economic settings. For example, there have been conflicts between customers who refuse to wear facial masks in a, in a retail establishment that has a policy for everyone entering their premises to be masked. It's my understanding that the five basic freedoms articulated in the First Amendment are not absolute rights, and freedoms such as freedom of speech can apply differently to governmental entities versus private entities. If I'm correct, how do you, as someone who has advised businesses, think we should consider these differences and their implications for exercising personal rights and securing public health as restaurants, gyms, museums, and malls open up? And can you also speak to the relevance, if any, of the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment as it relates to the private sector in this case? Sure. Um, well, 
one, um, let me start with masks because you, you, you started with them. You know, we have to convey a message through, you know, uh, health education and mass communication um, that we're asking everyone to wear a mask when they're in public. Um, not, and you should, you, sh you should do it for your own individual responsibility. You should do it for yourself, but more important, you're doing it for others. Right. Um, you're doing it for your parents, your grandparents, your neighbors, your family. Um, and so we need to appeal um, to uh, our uh, common humanity uh, and our duties to one another. I mean, I've one of the kind of um, one of the areas of ethical um, thought that I've been associated with for many, many years is, is I've 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 put it this way. You know, we we as Americans like to ask the question, you know. What does everyone else, including the government, owe me as a rights-bearing person um, to consent to freedom, to, to uh, uh, liberty in, in so many different ways? Um, and of course, that's important. You know, I understand that, of course. Um, but we have to start asking another question. Um, what duties do I have um, to my neighbor, to my family, to one to another, to ensure the common good. And COVID teaches us that more than anything else, the importance of selflessness, um, community orientation, uh, collective action, and you know, the public good. Um, that's really crucially important. And so you know, I, I, I do think um, it's absolutely lawful and ethical to ask somebody to wear a mask. Um, perhaps under the libertarian traditions of John Stuart Mill and others that um, you can't be forced um, uh, to deprive yourself of autonomy or liberty, but you can if you're posing a risk to others. Yeah. And so you have no right to put others at risk. And that's why we require you know, sheltering in place, uh, social distancing, masking, things like that. These are very strong and important measures that government should be uh, encouraging and even mandating. You know, virus, you know, in the United States, we've seen, you know, you know Republicans and Democrats and libertarians and, and, and socialists and, and uh, others, you know, of fighting with one another, but you know, viruses are not political. Yeah. Um, there's no democratic or republic virus, or, or we all want to be safe, no matter what our political ideology is. And so let's get past the politics uh, and think about you know our ethical values and our ethical responsibilities as civic, uh, you know, our civic responsibility to, yeah. to ourselves and our community. I think. It's critically important. You know, the, I don't think there are going to be equal protection problems um, per se, because the Supreme Court basically um, uh, doesn't have a very strict standard of equal protection unless um, the discrimination is based upon um, some uh, heightened standard like race um, or um, gender, things like that. Um, or religion, and I don't think that public health officials are, you know, targeting any particular race, religion, and so forth. Um, but if they did, there would be a huge uh, problem. So, for example, there was a case uh, back in the early 20th century. It's called Ju Ho, um, and there was a major um, cholera epidemic um, uh, taking place in uh, San Francisco. Uh, and there was a, a massive quarantine that was placed over a large district of San Francisco. Mm. The court struck it down, but it didn't strike it down because um, the public health authorities didn't have the power to quarantine. It struck it down because the quarantine was applied almost exclusively to um, Asian and Chinese Americans. Right. Um, and 
So the court famously said that public health had acted with a, um, an evil eye and an unequal hand. If we ever saw that with COVID, we would immediately react. But what COVID has taught us so vividly and so clearly, if we had any lesson, it would be this. It's highlighted the enormous health inequalities uh, in the yeah. United States. Yeah. No, I, I really uh, appreciate many of the points that you've just made about um, this pandemic, uh, hopefully opening all of our eyes on the importance of both civic responsibility as well as the need to address longstanding social and health inequities among uh, our neighbors and uh, communities who are that are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Yeah. So um, even as uh, we uh, continue to open up in phases, many localities and states are moving slowly to allow larger indoor gatherings, such as in houses of worship. Given what you've said earlier, uh, how should clinicians and public health policymakers think about and address those who argue that going to church, temple, or synagogue is a protected constitutional right and essential for their spiritual health? You know, I've been thinking about this quite a lot. Um, let me just begin by a couple of um, important facts that we need to understand. Um, the first fact is, is that um, congregations where you worship have been a major amplifier of COVID-19. We saw it in China, um, we saw it in Korea, we saw it in Iran, and we've seen it in the United States. Um, there are many um, super spreader events that uh, uh, go on in, in, in churches, mosques, temples, and others. Um, and so, to me, if you allow these kinds of services, knowing that you could be threatening the life of congregants and the families of congregants and their neighbors, you're actually doing a major disservice to the freedom of religion. You're not aiding the freedom of religion by saying, oh, well, it's okay to go back um, and get gravely ill or even die. Um, it's actually a disrespecting of religion. Um, but what's even worse, um, and I don't want to get too political here, but I really feel like I must. You know, the president has um, you know, called on all um, states and people to begin religi religious worshiping. At the same time, the CDC put out draft guidelines to say how you could worship in a safer way. Yeah. And the administration blocked them. So now you're saying to somebody, go back and do this. It's a huge risk, and we're not going to tell you how to mitigate that risk. That's utterly irresponsible, and I cannot think that that is in service of the freedom of religion. Uh, I think it's the exact opposite of it because it places a risk, a chill on, on, on worship. Um, and so I believe that you know, a people's conscience, their religion and others are extraordinarily important and I support them. Um, but to be respectful, um, to those people and to the whole community, we need to explain and even enforce whether it can be done safely, and if so, how it can be done safely and when it can be done safely. Um, so this is, to me, um, uh, you know, inexcusable. Um, and we know, I mean, it's just going to have a bad outcome if you, yeah. if you congregate all of those people together. Yeah. 
So um, up to this point in our conversation, Larry, we've been primarily talking about the balancing of civil liberties and public health in the U.S. context. But as we near the end of our interview, I also like to tap your international expertise, given that you direct the World Health Organization Center on National and Global Health Law. As we look at member states of the United Nations and their relationship with the WHO, I wonder if it's useful to draw some comparisons between human agency and national sovereignty. So confronted with global health threats, how one balances the interdependent authority and responsibility of the WHO and its member states would seem critical for a coordinated and effective global response. I've heard you say that given the devastating toll COVID-19 is taking across the world, it is past time to give the people of the world the WHO they deserve. <laughs> yeah, I did say that. So what do you think needs to be done to restructure the WHO and its relationship with member states to give humanity what it needs? Yeah, I mean, uh, that was very well put. Um, the, the um, you know, I've often said, you know, the, all the criticism of the World Health Organization, the, the truth is, you know, that countries like the United States, China and others have the WHO they deserve because they've not supported it politically, they've not given it any power, um, they haven't funded it, they've threatened to defund it, to, to withdraw our membership. Um, we saw at the very recent World Health Assembly, you know, a political, geopolitical struggle between the two world superpowers when we all should be coming together under a united, um, uh, strong uh, World Health Organization. Um, so for me, um, pandemics are a classic case why we need to work together globally. We need to harmonize. We're in such an interdependent world with travel, trade, um, mass migrations and refugees, um, uh, and also um, uh, zo zoonotic um, interchange you know with you know wild animals and and wet markets and uh, and avian migration flights across the world these are all we're we're in it together um, yeah. and if covid hasn't taught us that nothing will because um, it's something where you do need a much more coordinated response nobody's asking countries to give up their sovereignty we want strong sovereign countries to, to do, to have robust health systems. Um, we want them to um, uh, follow evidence-based responses. We, we do understand that uh, COVID-19 uh, affects different localities and countries differently than others, but you need to have evidence-based um, guidelines and guidance from the WHO. And you also need to have um, uh, a coordinated approach in terms of how we deal with um, so many of the pressing issues. Uh, perhaps I could just sum up with perhaps the most pressing issue there is. I just did a webinar for the World Bank about this today. Um, and it, it covers so many of the issues you've raised, um, which is right now, um, we are uh, in a race for a vaccine. Yeah. Um, there's never been a, a holy grail holier than trying to get a vaccine. It's the, it's the key to unlock all of our woes, um, uh, economically, socially, uh, human health, in so many different ways. Um, it can unlock all the loneliness, depression, hospitalizations, death, unemployment. Um, but we're in a big race for it. We need to be working together 
in that race. Uh, we need to share scientific information. Uh, countries shouldn't be uh, at loggerheads, but instead it's become more like, you know, a, um, a moonshot, a race to the moon. Who's going to get there first? Yeah. Um, remember Russia and the United States um, fighting with one another um, and to get to the moon. And now we see it with COVID and the vaccines. So we need that kind of cooperation, but even more important um, is equity. I do believe we're going to get a vaccine. I can't tell you when, but probably within the next year to two years. Um, we need to make sure that it's equitably distributed around the world. I can't imagine um, how international relations and global solidarity would unravel if we saw uh, people in the United States, Europe, uh, or even China being fully protected by the vaccine or mostly protected while countless millions of people died um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Indian subcontinent, the Middle yeah. East and places like that. That would be a, a nightmare. And we need to plan for equity and we need to plan for it now instead of you know, just unraveling and fighting with one another. Yeah, no, I think um, your um, concerns are justified. Let's hope that uh, our leaders, uh, our elected leaders or leaders around the world heed your advice and um, see this as a global health threat that requires all of us to work together. Yeah. That's no, go ahead, sorry. No, I just wanted to say that I wish we could probably spend more hours we could. Uh, talking to you and tapping your expertise, but we don't. And um, I wanna thank uh, Professor Gostin for being a guest on Ethics Talk. Uh, Larry, I appreciate you sharing your vast expertise and insights with our audience today. Thank you. I mean, the thanks all go to you. Um, you know, uh, what you do and what you've led um, uh, is incredibly important. You know, thinking about how we confront COVID-19 in a way that's ethical, equitable, and justice the way you've been doing, um, there's nothing more important. So thank you on behalf of all of us. Yeah. No, we all have to do our part, however yeah. big or small that is. Yeah. For more COVID ethics resources, please visit the AMA Journal of Ethics at journalofethics.org. And to our viewing audience out there, be safe and be smart. We'll see you next time on Ethics Talk. <laughs>